In this video, I'll be introducing some more examples of groups. Beforehand, I was really only using the symmetric group and some other basic examples, but now I'll really be introducing some good examples of groups. What I'll start off with is what is known as the group of motions, or the group of rigid motions. So the group of motions is going to be the group of all rigid motions, or transformations that preserve distances. So this is going to be a map, I'll call it phi, that is from Rn to Rn, is rigid. So this is a map that takes in some n-dimensional vector, outputs an n-dimensional vector. It's going to be called a rigid motion if for every, in case you don't know this upside down, A means for every or for all, V and W, an element of Rn, we have it that the distance between phi of V and phi of W is going to be equal to the distance between V and W. So it's distance preserving. I have R2 here, and I have two points, and I look at their image under this map. So maybe something like... The thing about them is that this distance is the exact same as this distance, okay? So no matter what two points I pick, their images distances are the same as their distances. This does nothing to the distances, and you may see this in the definition of congruency between polygons, is so that the image of the polygon under a rigid motion is going to be a congruent polygon due to the fact that it preserves distances. And so, what we say is the group of motions is going to be the set of phi from Rn to Rn, such that phi is rigid. So this is the set of all rigid motions, all of these distance-preserving uh, transformations. And it's going to be under the operation of composition. So composition, phi composed psi, what it's going to do is it takes in a point x, and it outputs phi of psi of x. So this just does one transformation and then it does the other one. So now, what's, what are some properties of this? I'll just call this um, G for now because I don't really have a better name. So G, as it turns out, is going to be isomorphic. Look at my previous videos. It's going to be isomorphic to Rn product with the orthogonal n group. Now what is the orthogonal group and what how how does this work? Well what this means is that this right here is Rn under addition, pairwise addition. And what this represents is just translations. I have a point V and I just send it to a different point that's just V plus some other vector T. So every single point gets sent to that point plus t. So Rn is just translations. These are obviously distance preserving. And so now what I have to do is deal with the orthogonal n group. What is the orthogonal n group? Well, what this is, it's all of the maps that preserve orthogonality. So I have these two vectors at the origin that are orthogonal, they're perpendicular. And what I want to do is look at all of the maps that keep these two things perpendicular. So that could be rotations or even reflections along certain lines. More definitively, what O of N is, is it's going to be equal to the set of matrices A, that's, um, those are the n by n matrices on R. So it's going to be some n by n matrix. And I have it that the determinant of A is equal to plus or minus 1. 
And another definition of this is that A transpose times A is equal to the identity. This is another formalization of orthogonality. And this one probably makes more sense because this just means that if I flip it, then I get the identity, so it's sort of orthogonal in a sense. This can be rotations or it can be reflections. Those also work. So now there's a certain subgroup of O of n. Subgroups are groups are subsets of those groups that are closed under the operation. And so, and it, this is going to be called S O N. Not the best name, but it's a subgroup of O N. And what it is, is it's going to be equal to the set of all A in the orthogonal N group such that the determinant of A is equal to 1. Now these are rotations. I just rotate it by an angle theta. This is true for SO2 and SO3, and it can generalize. This is the orthogonal group. This is the group of translations. This is the special orthogonal group. This is the group of motions. So now let's move on to something a little different. So an interesting thing to look at is the finite subgroups of O2. So the finite subgroups of O2, the orthogonal transformations, the first case is going to be the, the cyclic group generated by a rotation by an angle 2 pi over n. What does this mean? Well, this just means that I just do powers of this rotation by 2 pi over n. So I just do powers m of this rotation. So if I have my angle theta here, I just do the identity transformation, the rotation by theta, the rotation by 2 theta, the rotation by 3 theta, the rotation by 4 theta. These are all the multiples of the rotation. And this is a finite subgroup of O2 as long as it's in the form 2 pi over n, or else it will not get back to the identity and it'll go on forever and it's not finite anymore. So again, the cyclic group generated by a rotation by a special angle that makes it finite. Okay, number two is it's going to be the cyclic group generated by the rotations by a certain amount. It's going to be this group, except I add on to it the condition that I have this R. Now this R is going to be reflections. Let's look into this. Say I have this triangle, and I want to look at all the symmetries on this triangle. Well, of course, there's the do nothing. There's a rotation by 120 degrees, the rotation by 240 degrees, but there's also reflections. There's this reflection, this reflection, and this reflection. This is the group I've been looking at for a long time. This is precisely this group. This is the other finite subgroup. It's the group of symmetries on a polygon. So this formulation is dumb. This is the group of symmetries on a polygon. So I could do this with a square, right? I just have my square like this. I could do nothing, rotate it by 90, rotate it by 180 rotate it by 270, and rotate it by 360, which is just the do-nothing map. And I also have these four reflections. These are all orthogonal transformations. This is why it's a finite subgroup of O2. And it also is closed under the operation of composition. So what we usually call this is not the symmetry group on polygons. We call this the dihedral group on an n-gon. And the thing about this is that it has an order of 2n. 
because there's the n rotations and there's the n reflections and so many people may want to write this as d 2n although i'll just do dn for simple simpleness now this is one of the most important examples in geometry and all this stuff will be studied more later on i just wanted to introduce them here but now you may know about the symmetric group on n letters this is equal to the set of bijections from the set the set up to n into itself so and another way to phrase this is that i take you from this to itself again and i just flip them around all the place as long as no two elements go to the same element and every element in the output is hit those are just bijections and so this idea can be generalized and that's what i'm going to be doing now what we say is that the symmetric group on a set x this is for any set x is going to be equal to the set of phi from x to x such that phi is bijective and again bijective means every output is hit by one unique element in the input this is just a generalization of the symmetric group on n letters and of course it's going to be under the operation of composition again so phi composed psi it's the same as the group of rigid motions except i'm doing it with the symmetric group now of course the moment you've all been waiting for is z mod n z this is the cyclic group on n letters namely it's going to be the cyclic group generated by one of course one mod n Okay, because if I do 1, and then I get 2, and then I get 3, and then I go up till n minus 1, and then I get to 0, that's the cyclic group of order n. And any cyclic group is going to be isomorphic to this one. So if you remember back, I talked about the two finite subgroups of the orthogonal group. One of them was the cyclic group generated by the, rotational, the rotation by an angle 2 pi over n. Of course, this is going to be isomorphic to z mod n z. Now, the reason why these are isomorphic is because suppose I have a cyclic group generated by an element a that is going to be have order n. So this is a cyclic group of order n. What I could do is I could take a map phi from a into z mod n z. And what I could do is I could take a to the m and just send it to m. Now the reason why this is well defined is because if a to the r equals a to the k, that implies that r is congruent to k mod n due to the nature of these things. It's because this is of order n, so it repeats after every n element, and so these two must be congruent to each other mod n, which is precisely why this is well defined, because this is mod n. And then, the other thing we realize is that this is surjective due to the fact that this is of order n, this is of order n, and each one goes to a unique element. So this is obviously bijective, and the reason why a to the r times a to the k equals a to the r plus k, which will be sent to r plus k. And that's well defined due to this fact. So, z mod n z, although I sort of briefly skimmed over it, it is the cyclic group of order n. It is the group which is generated by a single element that is finite. So, this one right here is isomorphic to that one. And those are the most important examples of groups. That's it. Somebody wants